Good morning, church. I am so grateful to have you join me this morning. Normally, I do a lot of greetings and sharing, uh, asking people, thank you for jump for uh, uh, logging in. And But I just want to say to all those who are joining me today by Facebook and by YouTube, I'm grateful that you're able to join me this morning. But I have something that I really want to share with you, so I'm going to get right to the message. Father, I thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity today to come before your people and bring your word. I pray, Lord, that you would just have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to join me today in Romans chapter 12, and I want to read verse 18. Romans 12 and verse 18. Paul writes these words. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If it be possible, as much as lies with you, live peaceably with all men. I want to talk about the challenge to live in peace with all men. I praise God for being alive today and for having this this opportunity to come to you and share with you uh, a word from the Lord. This uh, Facebook, YouTube presentation has become a way in which we've had to do what we've got to do. Uh, the coronavirus has run us out of the building, but yet, even though we're out of the building, our mission and our assignment from the Lord has not changed. We still are to shine as light in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's what we're to do. That doesn't change. And God is still our shield. He's still our buckler. And he will protect us in the midst of this coronavirus and political upheaval and all the stuff economic challenges, whatever the stuff is going on, the Lord still will protect us. And even though it appears that the powers of darkness is exercising and flexing, uh, God is still bigger than the devil. But we have a responsibility and an obligation and assignment to shine as light in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now, when Paul writes here in this verse 18, to live at peace with all men, it's not just the church body that he has in mind. He means all men, all men. So to live, it means that you have to get out of the house and go to and fro. You have to interact with other people. And so in doing so, there has to be a certain level of respect and appreciation for other people's right to be as well. Now, you go out to your car to leave and you find a bee or a wasp in the car. Well, uh, you know, you, you, you can't allow that bee or that wasp to stay in there. So, so you're going to take some kind of action and, and either try to shoo the bee out or, or if you have to use some deadly force, you're going to take him out. Amen? All right. You're not going to let that bee fly around you while you're trying to drive. Well, certainly you have to look at people differently than you do a bug or a wasp or an insect. And certainly if you found a snake out there, you know you know that ain't happening. So, so you have to look at people differently. So the question is, when you talk about living at peace with all men, when you go out, and you see other people and you face other people and they face you, what do you see? Who do you see? Well, Paul, Paul had in mind, he had two things in mind. First, he had in mind that we in the body of Christ would be of one mind towards each other that neither would think themselves higher or lower than the other, but each one of us would have a gift, uh, or a place, an assignment that respects the others. And then secondly, Paul had a citizenship in mind 
that came from a Roman perspective. Paul was a Roman citizen. And what we find in, in Romans 13 is he says that we are to, to uh, uh, respect the government powers. But see, Paul's citizenship uh, respect, uh, perspective was that as a Roman citizen, Rome respected him and other Roman citizens respected each other. And the law enforcement of Rome respected Roman citizenship. In fact, when he went to Jerusalem and he was arrested and the, and the, and the police was about to whip Paul, Paul spoke up and asked, is it lawful for you to scourge a Roman citizen who is uncondemned? That means the scourge a Roman citizen who has not been to trial. And as soon as Paul spoke up and said he was a Roman citizen, the police dropped a whip because they had respect for him as a Roman citizen. So his citizenship gave him the, a peaceable privilege to go and come according to his own sense of freedom. So that's, those are the two things Paul has in mind. So, so even though you're going to encounter other people, he was saying as much as lies within you, be at peace or live at peace with all men. Now, Paul writes this letter to Rome and the citizens at Rome. And keep in mind, Rome was the seat of power. It was a seat, the capital of the Roman Empire. And so powerful people lived in Rome. And yet Paul says to the church, the saints at Rome, he's not encouraging them to, to network with the political powers of Rome but he's encouraging them to connect with the one who is the true source of power. And so he says to them, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that she may prove or understand what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. And then he says, no one should think highly of himself that he ought to be sober in your thinking. And whatever is your sense of calling from God, work that. And then he comes to verse 18. If it as much as, is, as lies within you, be at peace with all men. Now that, that brings me to the question, can you, uh, can you choose the men you're going to be at peace with? Well, he put a word in there, a three-letter word in there that does not allow me to choose. The word is all. Hello? He said all. Well, that brings me to what I want to talk about for us today as the saints of East Moline, the saints of the Quad Cities, the saints of the Mount Zion House, we who are members of the kingdom of God living here in the Quad Cities. It brings me to something I want to talk about. You have heard or have seen on the news about the push to remove Confederate monuments and concerning the Confederate flag. And I, I graduated from Thrasher High School in Boonville, Mississippi, Thrasher, Mississippi. And, uh, and our mascot was the Thrasher Rebels. We were, I was a rebel, a rebel. I, I did not, <laughs> Lord have mercy. I, my son and I talked uh, a few days ago. He graduated from Thrasher also. He said, Dad, do you realize we were rebels. I go, oh my God. And so I did not recognize. And I went online and, and checked Thrasher out now. And in their in the cafeteria, they have a big thing that says rebel yeah, rebel y'all, rebel y'all. So they're still rebels. The, the 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 team is still called the Thrasher Rebels. So I grew up in the midst of that, not really recognizing uh how much the Confederate uh, flag and all that idea was was part of my surrounding. Mississippi just voted a few days ago to remove the Confederate flag from the state flag from the state flag. And so so I learned some things this week as it relates to that flag that I did not know. And I want to share that with you and with us as a congregation. Because it will explain why 
living at peace with other men is going to take some work. And it's really going to take some work for the body of Christ to bring light to it. So I want to share this with you. I want to uh, put up the flag. And you you note you you note this. So William Thompson, who is the one who created the flag, designed it. This is the original flag. And here's here's what Thompson says. He created the flag, designed it, and gave it its purpose. And here's what William Thompson said about the Confederate flag. And we should listen, since he was the one who created it. Not only its design, but its symbolism and purpose. Here he is quoted in the book, Our Flag, by George Pribble. As a people, I want to give you this line, then I'll read the full statement. As a people, we're fighting to maintain the heavenly ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior or colored race. A white flag would thus be emblematic of our cause. Now, let me read the full statement. Our idea is simply to combine the present battle flag with a pure white standard sheet. Our Southern Cross, blue on a red field, to take the place of the white flag that is occupied by the Blue Union in the old United States flag or the St. George Cross in the British flag. As a people, we are fighting to maintain the heavenly ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior or colored race. A white flag would thus be emblematic of our cause. Upon a red field would stand for our Southern Cross, gem with the stars of our Confederation, all combined preserve in beautiful contrast the red, white, and blue. Such a flag would be chaste, beautiful, and significant, while it be easy made of silk or bunting and would be readily distinguished from flags of other nations. While we consider the flag which has been adopted by the Senate as a very dedicated improvement of the old United States flag, we still think the battle flag on a pure white field would be more appropriate and handsome. Such a flag would be suitable emblem of our young Confederacy and sustained by the brave hearts and strong arms of the South. It would soon take rank among the broadest insignias of the nation and be hailed by the civilized world as the white man's flag. You hear that? He designed it to be the white man's flag. Now the current flag has a, is a red on a red background, but it still has the, the cross, the, the blue cross with the stars. I, I want you to I want you to get that. That's what that flag means. Even those who fly the flag and have never owned slaves, never owned slaves, that flag is, is flying to represent white a superiority over the inferior or colored race. Well, so that means that means that to live peaceably and you have a person who's flying this flag, even though they have never owned slaves, it is a belief attached to it that they are superior and I am the inferior and therefore living at peace is gonna be challenging. Now, the question we gotta raise is, where did they get that from? Who gave them that idea? Where did that come from? Well, I've been sharing with you that Genesis chapter nine, the curse of Canaan, serve as the base for this thinking. You read in Genesis 9, and you can read all of Genesis 9 and 10 at your leisure. You need to read all the chapter, uh, all of chapter 9 and all of chapter 10. Noah, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Shem is the oldest, Ham, Japheth. And when we read around the bottom of chapter 9, it says that there was this something between Ham and Canaan and Noah. We don't know exactly what it was. It says that Ham saw the nakedness of his father. And there's been a whole lot of suggestion about what all that meant. But, the, but, the, but what is clear 
is it says that when Noah awoke, he says, cursed be Canaan. He does not say, cursed be Ham. Cursed be Canaan, not cursed be Ham. Now, but what the theologians did, what the white, particularly white clergy did, they took that passage where it says, cursed be Canaan, and they have started to say, curse it, and you'll find sometimes it's labeled the curse of Ham. And so it was curse of Ham, curse of Ham, curse of Ham, curse of Ham, repeated over and over and over and over and over again until, until finally people accept that it's the curse of Ham. But when the, the scripture clearly say curse of Canaan, all right? But they built this idea from this passage that, the, that Shem and Japheth would be superior over Ham. And that was the base for that thing. And that's where they got the idea that it was the heavily ordained uh, uh, direction from God that Ham and his seed would be inferior to the other two. That's where it comes from, all right? You know, it, it was always puzzling to me, and, and maybe I don't have to be puzzling to you, but, but think about this. In the Civil War, between the North and South, the South lost. They lost the war. But yet, the Confederate flag still flies. Hello? Even in the North, you see the Confederate flag. You say, well, why, does, why do they continue to fly a flag and they lost the battle? Well, see, now, my brothers and sisters, I recognize that the flag represents not just a battle, but a belief. It represents a belief that white men are ordained by God to be superior over the inferior and colored race. That's what the flag means. It's not about battle. See, see when you read this, it says, so the, the North and South both read the same Bible. And the North was opposed to slavery. And the South was pro-slavery. But notice, there's a big difference bet between saying, I'm opposed to slavery, or I am pro-slavery, as opposed to the idea, or I believe in superiority and inferiority. See, one can, believe, one can hold an idea of superiority without necessarily enslaving a person. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. One can hold an idea of inferiority and yet not be enslaved. All right? So what happened here was this. So even though the South lost the battle about slavery, they still maintain the mindset that has impacted this whole nation. In fact, this country had something what's called manifest destiny, which which was which was all of our United States that believe in in the in the superior authority of whites over the colored race. Where did they get that from? Again, they got it from a twisting of of, of, of the book of Genesis, chapter nine. Okay. All right. Now you might need some water with that. Now the question is, now that we know that, what are we gonna do with that? Well, see, 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 even though everyone reads the scriptures, and those who fly the flag read the scriptures, but they error in the reading. I understand, y'all. I understand now why God had me, why the Lord had me doing the light snack. And some of you might be new uh, to, to the, but, but he had me pour through the scriptures and create a, a, a graphic representation of the complete Bible, Genesis to Revelation, on one page. You can see a book from, from chapter one to the end of the chapter on one page. And so, so as I was doing that and, and, and came to the book of Psalms, 
you got 150 psalms. In fact, psalm, I was, I was dragging my feet to do psalm because it was 150, and I didn't know how to do it. And I said, Lord Jesus, I, I, but he had guided me that so far. I don't know why I was, why I was reluctant, but, but he showed me how to do it. So I ended up putting 50 psalms on each page. So you got, you, so psalm occupies three pages. So they get to the to the last of the psalms, which, I, which I'm dealing with, Psalm 101 to Psalms 150. And I didn't see this when I did Psalm 78, but I, what I saw it when I come to Psalm 105 and 106. That's when I saw Jacob came to sojourn in the land of Ham. And I saw it, I go, whoa. And then I saw it again. This is Psalm 105, verse 23. I saw it again at Psalm 105, verse 27. And then I saw it again at Psalm 106 and verse 22, land of Ham. And it was there that I recognized, oh my God, what they, was, what they said about Genesis 9 was error. Because, because Egypt, it says Jacob came to storage on in the land of in Egypt, the land of Ham, the Egyptians the sin from Ham's son, misery. And so that means the Egyptians, descendants and seed of Ham, were the slave masters over Israel for 430 years. Yeah. Yeah. Now let me, let me make sure you, you got that 430 years correct. So Jacob comes into Egypt his son Joseph is on the throne and Jacob lives a period of time and then Jacob dies and then Joseph lives for a number of years and then Joseph dies. So that's part of that 430. So, but at the end, when Joseph dies, it says there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And that from that period forward is when Israel is put in bondage, but they're in Egypt. The seed of Ham is in control. So what happened was, over the years, we've always tried to explain it from Genesis 9. And you can't explain it from Genesis 9 with the lie that has been told that Ham was cursed because you can't explain it. But when you come to the Psalms, you can. That Ham was not cursed. Canaan was cursed. Because God gave Israel the land of Canaan. He gave them Canaan land, not Ham land. Now, what do we do with that? As the body of Christ, we recognize that there are, there are brothers and sisters who are flying this flag that believe that they have divine authority to be superior over others. And the way we challenge them is not by challenging the flag, but by saying, brother, uh, have you ever read Psalm 78, verse 51? Or Psalms uh, 105, verse 23 to 27? Or Psalm 106, verse 22? I, I suggest you, you know, take a look at it. And what you do is you, you challenge them at the level of their belief that they believe God gave them this authority. And when they go to that and look at that, then that's how we begin to to unhook them from a false belief. Amen. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I was, I was in a Zoom meeting a few days ago with some pastors, and, and see, the, what, 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 what excites me about this is that the Lord allowed me to do this, to find Psalm 78, 51, 105, 23, 27, 106, verse 22. Find it in the scriptures so that, so that I can refer them. Go look in the book that you already have on your shelf as opposed to saying, go read somebody else's book. Go read what the Lord has given us. And that's how we unhook our white brothers and sisters from believing that they have this ordained right to be supreme and superior over others and believe God ordained it. God did not do that. Man took that idea and imposed it with power and force and economics. 
But brothers and sisters, I tell you, I am, I am happy today that we as the body of Christ, we in the kingdom of God, can take this message and share it with other brothers and sisters. And I encourage you to run tell that, run tell all of them, that truth will indeed make us free. We've been enslaved by a lie, but Jesus has come to turn on the light. Hey, and I tell you that once we begin to, to, to share this, it then will bring us the possibility now that we can live at peace with all men because when I see them and when they see me, we both operate from a position that God has created one man, none is superior or inferior to the other. My brothers and sisters, that's all I got today. But my soul is happy because now I know we can attack this thing with a sense of light and truth and bring peace to our land if we, if we use truth as the foundation. Now, I can't do this by myself, but all of us have a, an, a, an assignment and mission to tell others that that flag you're flying is based on an error in scripture. But the truth is, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for all men, red, yellow, black, and white. Those are colors that we have assigned. But he gives, shed his blood to redeem all of us because he died for treasure and not for trash. Share this message with others. Don't keep your lips zipped. Share it with, with everyone. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for our church family today that you would use us, Lord, to spread this message, to explain to others how this flag has been flown to represent an era of scripture, of superiority and inferiority that they believe came from you. But now we know the truth. Use us, Lord, to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.